All right, here we go. Seven o'clock, and I think we're about ready to rock and roll tonight. I see that the room is starting to populate already. Hello, everybody. Uh, I put some directions up about how to get in here if you haven't figured it out already. It's not completely intuitive, but all you have to do if it doesn't prompt you to do it, sometimes Facebook prompts you to do it, but if it doesn't, go to StreamYard.com slash Facebook and just follow the instructions and uh, it'll accept your credentials. And I'm seeing all kinds of names tonight, which is a good thing. So let's talk about a couple of things before we get rolling into day two. Uh, I just got back from a um, my first motorcycle ride, really, in basically a couple of years. I, I, I rode once last year, uh, and that didn't work out too well. I rode some the year before, but it, I didn't ride anything too hard because I was having a hard time even two years ago riding. So I went down to the Mojave Desert and did the Mojave Road with a couple of buddies of mine. Uh, Brian and David Lee, who are two Vito veterans, good friends of mine, solid dudes, uh, crazy. And in point of strength, both those guys could play a game of volleyball by tossing me back and forth across the roof of a barn. And they're, they're just absolute superb riders. So I knew that that would be a good trip because those guys would press me. They, don't, they got no slow button. Everything is 110% with those guys. We went down there. Did 500 miles in two days, and we had a riot. Uh, everything on my body hurt except my hip, which is holding up quite well. Uh, managed to pass kidney stone while I was out in the middle of the desert, which was more than I wanted. But I had a good time, and uh, everything held up. So I think that uh, as long as I continue to ease my way back into it and don't have any major league get-offs, I'll be able to ride this summer, and I'm looking forward to it. I've already reached out to a lot of you out there who are friends of mine to uh, – to set up some rides this summer. It ought to be a lot of fun. I'm going to start this weekend going out into the desert. Uh, I've got a couple of the routes plotted for day two out in the desert, but I need to come up with some more. I want to have at least half a dozen so I can assign them on a rotating basis, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Two things on this ride um, that uh, I got to play with that uh, – were interesting. Uh, the Climb Adventure GTX boot, which I wanted to talk to you about tonight, is just, it's an outstanding product. Climb has completely undersold this thing. I know why they're doing it, but I'm here to tell you, I'm not ever wearing another set of boots. Those things are great for the kind of riding that you're going to be doing on the Tour of Idaho. They're way better than any plastic motocross boots. They're better than my Garnet SG12s. They're better than my CD Crossfires. They are absolutely wonderful. Now, any item of clothing is necessarily a, a real subjective thing. You know, what fits me and feels really good to me may not feel really good to you. But I, I don't know anybody that thinks that plastic motocross boots are, are, are comfortable. That's just, it's kind of crazy to think that. So I really like these things. It's the Climb gtx adventure booter i think on their website it's actually the adventure gtx boot is what they call it and i have a set in the lime green and gray it's actually a lighter color than it appears on the screen there they weren't as hot as i thought they would be it was 90 to 95 degrees everywhere we were in the desert uh they do require some break and they felt a lot better the second day than they did the first but i put 500 miles on them Really varied kind of riding, everything from fairly technical to, you know, wide open bull sport. I soaked them a couple of times. There's a couple of deep water crossings in the middle of the Mojave. People don't believe that, but it's true. And in one place, I was the only guy that had dry, dry feet. Uh, those things really, really work well. I had a set of the car over the boot pants. And uh, when we were in water that was, you know, basically way up over the foot pegs, trying to get through it without killing our bikes, and I had to dab my foot even a couple of times. My feet didn't get wet. Those things are really, really good. And I, I have ridden across that very same crossing dozens of times. My feet have always gotten wet. It's the first time I ever came out dry. So they're super comfortable. I have no doubt they're going to be durable. Um, they fit me really well. I'm going to go ahead and put the insole that Climb gives you. They give you an additional insole because they only come in full sizes. So to take up some of the volume, they give you an additional insole. And I'm going to go ahead and put that in. But these things are plush. 
And, you know, there was there uh, in the parts of the ride we did that are outside the Mojave Preserve, there's been a lot of damage done by by UTVs. And any of you that ride very much in the desert know what I'm talking about. These UTV whoops are just terrible. They're 18 inches apart. They're 18 inches tall. They can go for 100 miles. And we ran into a section of that. And if I'd been in my SG12s, I think I would have died. But these boots have a thick enough sole. And let me, let's go down through here. The soles of these things are beefy. They're they're really nice. They're super comfortable. They're grippy. Uh, the one thing that there's the sole. The one thing that uh, they do have kind of a, a big toe box on them. It's a fairly thick toe box. They have shifter pads on them. You can see those there. So they do take a little bit of getting used to, but I was used to them after about the first 30 miles. I didn't miss a shift after that. It's just, it's a little bit of a learning curve and you're going to be just fine. They're super easy to get on and off. Uh, they are not going to provide you as much protection in the shin as a set of plastic motocross boots will do. But once you get down to this area right here, they are at least as protective as all plastic motocross boots that I know about. I mean, we're talking something really beefy. Uh, they would equal my SG-12s, I'm guessing, and they're better than my CD Crossfires. They're, they're wonderful boots. They're comfortable to walk around in. And uh, as long as Climb makes them or until somebody uh, gets me something in my hands that are better, that's going to be the boot that I wear for almost all the riding that I do. So I'm here to tell you that I really, really like that Climb Adventure GTX boot. It's a, it's a really, really good boot. Uh, I see uh, there's a question there about the weight. Yeah, I haven't weighed them yet. You can go on the Climb website and they'll tell you what they weigh, but they don't weigh any more than uh, my SG12s. That's the kind of thing that's going to vary by size. So if you have really big feet like I do, I wear a size 13 or size 14 boot. They're all kind of heavy. Uh, but, uh, you know, just in uh, picking them up and comparing them side by side, just, you know, I sort of compared them size wise and weight wise. They didn't feel like they weighed any different, but I've got a really accurate scale in the shop. And that's a good question. I'll go out and I'll put them on the scale and and try to post that up in the next day or so. But they're great boots. and They're even cheaper than high end motocross boots. If you buy the SG12s or the CD Crossfires, which is what I've worn exclusively for the last dozen years or so. I was in Alpine Stars the first few years I rode. Those things are spendy. You know, they're five or six hundred bucks, and these boots are less than five hundred dollars. Now, do they give you overall as much protection as a plastic motocross boot? No, they do not. The plastic boot is really rigid. You know, it, it, it's harder to flex. But for trail riding, I don't think you need all that. You know, nobody's going to run over you in a berm. Uh, you're unlikely to get your foot caught up in your chain riding trails. For the most part, we're riding slower. And, uh, you know, like kicking them off rocks. And I whacked a Joshua tree really hard with one of my boots once, and they're fine. They're just as protective as the, as the SG-12. It's, again, in that low part of the boot. Up high, way up high in the shin area. They're not as protective uh, and probably because the boot flexes a little bit more easily, you know, it probably doesn't protect your ankles as much. But again, I maintain that you don't need that. Um, I think they're fine for what we do and you'll love the comfort and you'll love the fact your feet will stay dry. So they check all the boxes for me. That's the boot I'm wearing from now on. And uh, John Summers, thanks a lot for hooking me up with a pair. That was a, a really good discovery. Something else that I tried out on this trip uh brian and david are really big on these cardo intercom units and the one that they like is the pack talk bold i think that's what it's called so uh, i found one pretty inexpensively out in the web i ordered it up i found one for about 200 bucks ordered it up put it in my helmet and you know what that thing is not bad uh most of the race radios that i've used in the past when i use those kind of things have a lot of wires and stuff and there's a button that you got to push that you velcro to your handlebars to talk and all that and, and and my experience with those has been that the radios are really good but the wires wear out this thing for something that's all integrated into a little unit that sits on the side of your helmet with a little microphone that you attach to it is pretty doggone good the speakers are jbl speakers and they're really nice uh you control a lot of it with an app on your phone and uh I'm telling you what, man, I really like that dog thing a lot, too. Uh, the range isn't all that great. Even out in the desert, uh, every once in a while, we get separated by a little bit. And uh, 
I noticed that when you, it, it's definitely not good for more than a mile, even out in the desert, even with everybody's antennas up, once you get out to about a mile, uh, the odds are not good that you're going to be able to talk to each other, but you can, I mean, it's pretty nice. You can listen to the music and stuff like that. And I don't use those things very much. I'm not really big on them just because the inconvenience has always outweighed whatever benefits I thought they might have. And plus, I don't like talking to people that much anyway, not when I'm riding. I'd rather just ride. I don't listen to music. I, I like, I just ride. That's what I like to do. But if you like these things, I think that Cardo Pack Talk Bold is a pretty doggone good unit to look at. And uh, Brian and Dave are, are, are pretty good about really researching things thoroughly before they recommend them. So I felt pretty confident when I bought this thing that I wasn't going to spend $200 for nothing. And I think the street price that you can find them for anywhere is about $240 or $250. I found a really good deal on one. So... What else? Uh, and then the last thing is that um, I've had two big adventure bikes in my garage for the past few weeks, and I've been riding them a lot. One of them is a 790 Adventure R, which is the one that's all tarted up. It's got the really cool suspension in it and the blue gas tank. And my understanding is they're basically unobtainium, or at least were for a long while. And the other one is a 990, which is similarly tarted up it's got everything in the world on it. these bikes have first rate suspensions the motors have been massaged and uh my buddy chris hymas that runs pocatello power sports who's one of the owners is one of the tuning geniuses of the entire planet so these guys left these bikes with me so that chris can perform his magic on them and i'm going to be taking them to him in a week or so so uh that they, they're doing auto tune types of uh tunes if you know what that is so I've ridden these bikes a lot, side by side, ridden them in lots of different terrain. And, uh, I, you know, I, I got to tell you, I like the 990 better than I like the 790. Uh, the 790 to me feels like a really big dirt bike. It's a wonderful motorcycle. And uh, if you're one of these kind of guys that, that wants to try to ride the most technical stuff possible on sort of a, a middleweight dual sport, that's the bike for you because it feels just like a really big, really well suspended dirt bike with just a ton of power, but man, it's heavy. Um, it, it's a big, heavy bike. If you got to lift it up off the ground, but as long as you don't drop it, man, that thing is great and technical terrain. Holy cow. That thing will do anything. You know, I'm pretty sure you could ride some pretty technical stuff on that bike. The only problem would be wrestling it back up onto the trail if you chucked it off the side because it's a heavy bike. But I liked it. But if I were going to buy one, and I, I just might, I think the bike of the two, I'd prefer the 990 because, the again, the 790 feels like a really big version of my 450X or a KTM 500 or something like that. It does what that bike does, but it's bigger and it's heavier. And when you get it out on the road, it just it rolls better down you know dirt roads and, and highways. You can get it out in the freeway and... You're off to the races. My 450 will do that too, but it's because of gearing and the way the motor's built. But clearly, you know, I wouldn't want to ride my 450 to Alaska on roads. And this bike, I think you probably could and be just fine. He's got a seat concept seat on it, and the thing is really nice. It's plush. But when I think of big adventure bikes like that, I think riding dirt roads from here to Patagonia. That's what comes to mind to me. And I got to tell you, that 990 Baja that this fella's got, is the bike that I would take of those two. That is a nice, nice motorcycle. Are either of those good for the Tour of Idaho? No, they're not. And the 990, of course, would be way worse than the 790. Uh, the 790, you know, you could probably get through parts of it, but and a good enough rider could get through all of it, but, oh, my God, it would just it would beat you to death. I mean, just the extra weight that you have to deal with every time you make any little moderate direction change or anything, I think it beat the crap out of you after a while. And that's kind of a segue into uh, I'm going to talk in one of the upcoming PBR Mondays about why we recommend the bikes that we do. And we recommend things from, you know, 300 two strokes like the KTM 300 is a really good Tour of Idaho bike. If you don't mind two strokes, uh, that's, I think, the best one to do a, a 250 because of its the way it's tuned and the gearing and stuff, I don't think is as good, although several people have done it on a 250. Really, it's, you know, if you like the bike, that's probably fine, as long as it's a reasonably light bike. So these 250, 300, two-strokes are fine, and then a 350 through a 500, four-stroke. Those are all good. 
And my next tour bike will be a KTM 350. I think that's pretty much what I've decided on. Um, it's a little lighter than the 500. And uh, again, I've got bikes for, uh, for dual sporting. I, I, I want just a trail goat. And that 350 is just a little heavier than my 300. It's geared a little different. Motor's a little different. I think it'll work just fine for me. Uh, that's a really subjective thing. On our trip, there was some technical terrain. The guy on the, um, the 790 handled it all just fine. The fellow on the 990, who's a stud rider, who's really good, he, he had some trouble with that bike because it's a big bike in really technical places. He's a really, really super good rider. And, uh, you know, it wasn't like we dropped him or anything, but he, he would show up and he'd say, yeah, my knee's hurt and I'm tired. And it's because, you know, those bikes are big, the weight's up high, the way they're suspended, the nature of the power delivery. You want something that's nimble and agile and something that you can pick up and huck over a log if you can't saw it. That's what you want for the Tour of Idaho. And we tell people that all the time. Every year people want to argue with us. And my response to that is, you know, you want to argue, you knock yourself out. But don't come crying to me when, you know, you, it, the bike beat you to death. You couldn't get it over a log. It, you know, it didn't work because you ran through a creek crossing and all of a sudden all the electronics went bad. Those are things that can happen. So do, just make sure that it is a dirt bike that's reasonably light. And a dirt bike, too, not a dual sport. These days, some of these, you know, a lot of bikes these days that are on the real dirt bike end of dual sport are just fine. Uh, but the 350 that I'm going to buy is not the dual sport version. I'll buy just the regular dirt bike version of the one that's got the headlight and nothing else. And in Idaho, I can get a plate for that. If I live somewhere else, I might go ahead and get the dual sport version of it because it doesn't add very much weight to it. And it only changes it slightly. I think that'd be just fine. So let's get into day two today. And the first thing I want to get into is uh, a lot of you very alertly, uh, I'm amazed that you all are up to date on this, are aware of the fact that there's a local trails issue around here that involves some of the day two trails, specifically lead draw. Lead draw has become a big illegal shooting area. You're not supposed to be up there with guns, but people have been doing it for generations, so it's kind of hard to stop. Of greater concern to me than getting shot, I mean, on a dirt bike, they're going to hear you coming. It's the hikers that have the big problems with this, but a greater concern to me is when you go through that parking lot into lead draw from the road, you might want to really pick your path carefully because I've gone up there with a magnet before and picked up thousands of nails in less than a half an hour's worth of work. People burn a lot of pallets there, and it's just a mess. So uh, lead draw is closed right now, but it, 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 it's a temporary closure. It's They're going to have that fixed, I'm quite sure, by the time the Tour of Idaho runs around. In fact, I think I know what the solution is going to be. But if they don't, I mean... Uh, it, the same rules apply as apply any place else. The trails close. You're just obligated to get back on the route as quickly as possible. And if you'll notice, that closure affects the main day two route. It also affects the challenge section. But all you have to do, really, is there's a waypoint. Uh, it's, uh, let's see, 2D XYZ9, then 2D XYZ10 is where lead draw starts. You just go up to, you just don't go up through lead draw. You're going to miss a little bit of single track, but you just go up to 2D XYZ 13. You get right back on the trail there. That's the quickest legal way to get back on the trail. There's not a challenge point up there, and you wouldn't even be assessed a penalty if the trail's actually closed. And uh, you're not really missing very much because there's only a little bit of that trail that's cool. Similarly, if you decide to do the challenge section that day, which we're going to talk about, when you come back down, Instead of going down in the lead draw and then going up the paved road a little ways to get back on the challenge section, just at waypoint, uh, let's see, what is it, uh, 12 on the challenge section, just turn south, go through uh, XYZ 12 to XYZ 13, then turn back north and go back down to the road and get on it. In both ways, you're just missing a couple of miles of trail. It's not any big deal. It's super easy to route around. And that's what you should do uh, if it's not fixed. But I am I have a high degree of confidence that that problem is going to be solved by the time that uh, summer rolls around. So let's talk a little bit about day two and let's start out 
talking about day two by talking about what happens before day two, which is your off day in Pocatello, which we very highly recommend. We don't insist on it. It's not mandatory, so you don't lose any points if you don't take that day off in Pocatello. But you don't get a day off anywhere else. Pocatello is the last and only town where you're going to find a good motorcycle shop, where you're going to be able to find basically anything that you need for the tour of Idaho. It makes complete sense for you to stop in Pocatello. Take the day off. You'll be able to get a bunch of supplemental points, visit all the restaurants, visit all the stores. Uh, by the way, we're taking red wing boots off this year. I'll make that adjustment on the page, and uh, we'll, we'll stick something else in there to make up for that. Uh, Jason retired. So he no longer owns the Red Wing Boot Store, so there's no reason to go there. Uh, you don't get to talk to the legend. So I'm going to take that off, and we'll find something else for you to do to get that supplemental point. Or if not, I'll reduce the number of supplementals that are needed. So, uh, you know, you get that day off. It gives you a chance to recalibrate. There are certainly some things that you're going to learn on your first day of the tour. First day is one of the two hardest days. You know, the way you tied stuff on might not be good. Your bike might be running too lean. There were a bunch of teams last year that boiled gasoline in places where they shouldn't have boiled gasoline. And uh, they were saying, well, it must have been hotter than we thought. And I'm going, no, your bike's running too lean. Uh, he had something to do with it, but I'm sure that was tune. You know, all those teams were racers, and I think they showed up with their bikes in race tune. And uh, a rich bike's a happy bike when it comes to Tour of Idaho kind of stuff. Uh, or if they were running fuel injection, you know, they had a wrong map in it or something like that. All that stuff you get to sort out in Pocatello. Uh, that day of rest, you're going to really appreciate after your day one. And also, it gives you an opportunity to really get going early on day two, which is important. We had teams last year that left at one in the morning for day two, and they didn't make a mistake. There were a couple of days last year when the temperatures were well into the triple digits out in the desert. And there were some teams that got out there and made it to American Falls by 10 o'clock in the morning and good on them because they were able to get through the desert before the heat of the day really got to them. If you get out into the desert, you know, anytime in mid morning or before you're going to get across the worst part of it before it really starts to get hot because at night out in that desert, it gets really cold. Even in the middle of summer, if you're out, if you've ever had to spend the night out in the desert, even when it's been a hundred degrees that day, it gets really cold at night. So it takes a while for it to get hot again. The first part's what you're worried about, the part up through the American Falls Sand Bowl and beyond. Once you get north of that, you're typically riding at speeds that are high enough. It's not going to get to be too bad. So you want to make sure that you have the ability to get a super early start on day two if you look out and see that the forecast is for 105 degrees out in the desert. And you don't have that opportunity if you don't take that day off in Pocatello. Even if you're super fast, you're probably not getting here early enough in the afternoon that you're going to feel really good about getting up at, uh, you know, 3 in the morning to get going the next day. It's just the way it works. I'll also tell you that there is almost a 100% correlation between teams that take the day off in Pocatello and teams that succeed. There have been a couple of teams that succeeded without that day off, but in, in all cases they told me, later they wish they'd taken the day off it just makes sense also it's hard to find me if you don't take that day off so i don't know what you're going to do in that blank spot in the desert because that day off is usually when i track you down somewhere and i give you the coordinates for it. but anyway so your day two is probably going to start pretty early in the morning uh, i'd be on the bike rolling out of town by absolutely no later than 5 a.m during tour season, 5 a.m. means that it's starting to get, if you're in July, it means that it's actually daylight at 5 a.m. If you're sort of uh, later in August, it means that uh, you're starting to see a little bit of twilight at 5 a.m. But in any case, it won't be long before you're able to, to ride without a headlight. The only thing that kind of sucks is the first few miles of trail. You, you go out of town, it takes a little while to get to the trailhead. It's four or five miles depending on what hotel you're staying at. You get to a trailhead, the Gibson Jack trailhead, and almost immediately you're on this trail that's really narrow. It's, it's rarely ever brushed, so it's got really tall weeds growing to the side. It's really kind of hard to, to see what's going on off the edge of that trail. And in places, uh, there's some side hilling, and, and you don't want to drop 
a wheel off the left side of that trail most of the way. Uh, you wouldn't get hurt, but it might be kind of hard for you to get your bike back up on the trail. Uh, we did have one guy a few years ago that we had to go back in and get because he couldn't get his bike back up on the trail. Um, but anyway, uh, that, oh, by the way, one other thing, if you're doing your work and you're studying aerial photos, you should notice once again that all of the underlying trail maps are wrong right at the Gibson Jack trailhead. They're all wrong. So what you have to do is get there and notice that I've put the waypoints in strategic places. It's a big, grand, new paved parking lot. It's really big. The trail that you want is out of the west end of the parking lot, right where the road hooks and comes into the parking lot. There's a big corner there. There's a sign and maybe even a little kiosk. I know there's a, a, a doggy bag dispenser there. And that's where the trails go off. Then almost immediately the trails split, you take the left fork. And there's waypoints there to help guide you, but you should see all that if you study the aerial photos. You zigzag up the hill a little bit. It's really easy to get on the wrong trail because you zigzag up that hill. And within a three quarters of a mile, there's a quad trail that takes off to your right. And you actually go down to your left and then you make an immediate right. The old trail used to come up there. A lot of people get confused there and they try to ride down the old trail back to the parking lot. If you study it on aerial photos, satellite maps and stuff like that, it'll be apparent. But the waypoints are where you need them to be. You ride down that trail, and it's one of the nicest single tracks on the tour. Uh, it goes down a creek drainage for a long way. Then it starts to climb, and right where it starts to climb, you'll notice there's a waypoint that's kind of way off to the left. Uh, so you're riding up a trail, and you're looking at your next waypoint. It looks like it's way off to your left, several hundred yards. And that's because there's a new trail that's been cut in there. The old trail goes right up this really nasty gully. And we want to keep you out of that on a loaded tour bike. Plus, we want to keep everybody out of it because of the erosion. So there's a brand new trail that we cut in that's got a couple switchbacks that goes around that big steep gully. It's extremely pleasant. It's way better than the original trail. It adds a little lake to it. It's got some really pretty scenery up there. That's the one you should take. You get up high, you go around Slate Mountain, uh, ride some really, really outstanding fun trail, and you're going to come down to a road. Um, you take that paved road, you turn left, you go, oh, I don't know, maybe three quarters of a mile and you turn right and you're on the road that goes to Scout Mountain. And that's where the lead draw thing becomes an issue. Once again, if lead draw is still closed by then, which I highly doubt, there's a super easy way to get around that. If you look at the maps, you'll see it. You'll just be off our route for a couple of miles right back on it. Perfectly legal. You're good to go if you do that. If you have any questions, I'll talk to you about it. Excuse me when you're here in your day off. But I think that'll be a non-issue by the time you're there. Similarly, the trail going up the Crestline Cycle Trail going up to the top of Scout Mountain is fantastic. It's one of the best trails on the tour. I think you'll really like it. It gets up high, and it's got a really alpine character up near the top. There's some side hilling up there. And if you're around early enough in July, there's some snow patches that you might have to get through. Um, but anyway, uh, Scout Mountain's your first challenge point of the morning. And, and, no matter what you do, you go to the top of Scout Mountain first. So if you intend to do the challenge section, which is fine, make sure you go to the top of Scout Mountain first. Because if you try to do it after the challenge section, you're going to penalize yourself. You're going to be riding more than you need to. So go to the top of Scout Mountain. You might have to walk the last few hundred feet. Uh, the gate there is always closed. You can ride around it on a dirt bike if you want to. Uh, you don't need to walk all the way up there, but... Um, it's right at the top is where I want you to be. So once you've done that, you come back down, you have a choice whether you want to continue on the regular route or whether you want to do the challenge section. I've always told people that the day two challenge section is not the one that you want to do probably just because it gets you out into the desert way later. It doesn't advance you an inch because you end up back basically where you started. Um, this year, it does something a little bit different, um, but time-wise, it's a wash. You're going to spend, um, if you decide to do that challenge section, it does cut off a little bit of trail, but it takes a lot longer to do the challenge section. It's a fun challenge section. I, I really like this. I put some of my favorite trails on there. 
Uh, it's single track, then it gets into a quad trail, which at first isn't very much fun, but then gets funner and funner as it goes along. Then you get into another single track, which is just awesome, and it pops you back down into lead draw. There's a little bit of quad trail that takes you over to the single track that takes you out up to the East Fork. So it's a better challenge section than it used to be. I like it a lot. It's got single track on it, which the other one had a little of, but not a lot. This one's got a lot more. But I wouldn't do it unless I knew for a fact it was going to be a cool day in the desert or I was there at 4 o'clock in the morning, uh, one of those two. So uh, that's another one to approach with caution. Um, it, it doesn't advance you very far. In fact, it, time-wise, it doesn't advance you at all. And if it gets you out into the desert late that day, your tour of Idaho may be over at that point. So once you get out of the scout mountain area you hit a set of farm roads and these farm roads are all pretty freaking fun and they take you all the way across the arban valley um, it's super easy to find your way over into the deep creek range you go up some jeep roads to the top of deep creek then there's a quad trail up there at the very top um, the challenge there's a challenge point right up on the deep creek crest and it's just a little bit off of the trail you could park your bike and just walk up there if you want to, but you can walk right up to this bump of the ridge and there's a really panoramic 360 degree view, but it's not right on the trail. It's a little bit off to the rider's left up on top of the knoll. You'll see it up there. And the waypoint is placed exactly where the challenge point is. You, it looks like almost a little out and back when you look at it on the map. Uh, there's a, it's really easy to get lost coming down out of there. There's two ways out. There's a, there's left fork and right fork, and uh, some people occasionally get lost and they take the right fork out. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna get too upset about that. Uh, the two trails parallel each other. They're they're on the opposite sides of a ridge. The way that I take you out is shorter and it's far easier. The reason I generally don't penalize anybody for taking the wrong way out is the wrong way out's a lot longer and uh, will actually put you behind. But once you get out of the Deep Creek Range, uh, you cross the next valley over, which is the Rock Creek Valley, Rockland Valley sometimes it's called. And uh, that takes you over to the next range over. You're in the Basin and Range region. Geomorphologically, you're in the Basin and Range region here. And the, uh, the tops of the ranges are all part of an ancient petaplain, and a hot spot moved underneath this area, and it caused the crust to stretch. The valleys are what are called grobbins or downdrop blocks, and they all blocked out. Or they all dropped out a long time ago, which is what's responsible for the really unique topography that you see when you drive across southern Idaho, northern Nevada, parts of Oregon. It's that it's called basin and range. So the next range over is a. Uh, Hold on here. I just kludged my map. What's it called? It's in the Sawtooth Forest. What's this range called? The Sublet Range. There you go. So the Sublet Range, there's just, there's not a great way of getting you through there. Kind of is what it is. Uh, there's a cool little section up where the challenge point is. At 2D XYZ64, there's an out and back to the challenge point. It's not Badger Peak, by the way. A lot of people make that mistake. That's hard to get to. This one's much easier. Then you go north. You hit the river. Uh, if you have time, Register Rock, which is right along the paved road there, is a pretty good little place to stop. And then that's going to take you into American Falls. And what I tell everybody and have told everybody for years, and it still applies this year because we haven't changed anything in terms of getting you to American Falls, is that you should be in American Falls by no later than noon. Noon is a really good time to be there if you want to avoid the heat of the day in the desert. So get up early and make sure you're rolling into American Falls at noon. We tell everybody to go to the co-op, which is right along the route. There's a waypoint right in the parking lot. They've got free gas there. Uh, by the way, Pocatello now has a half a dozen places that sell free gas. All the Maverick stores have free gas. All the Sinclair stations have free gas. And in the route description, I try to tell you every place I know about that carries free gas, and almost every place you're going to go has free gas. North Fork's the exception. They don't have any clear gas there. 
So you're going to get to American Falls. You go to the co-op. The co-op is a cool place. Uh, they got really good food there. I always sit down and just pound as much water as I can, drink some electrolytes, and I have myself a sub sandwich or something before I set off in the desert. Uh, we had to shorten the section out of American Falls just because of private land concerns. So the, you know, riding out of American Falls is not as cool as it used to be, and there's just nothing I can do about it. It is what it is. There's a little short section that we take you through, and I may monkey with it even a little bit more than I have already, but there's a, a short section that we take you through uh, right off the road. Then you get back on the road, and you go down to the American Falls Bowl proper. There's the infamous drop through the rocks that gets into the sand bowl. It's kind of fun whipping through the dunes and stuff in there. Then you're out on some cow paths that take you up north. You get back on the road that parallels the Wapai lava flow to the east, Pleasant Valley Road. And that's going to take you all the way up to a waypoint called 2DXYZ135. Right there, you'll notice that your navigation ends. There's no waypoints until you get up to Big Southern Butte. So this year we started something new. And most of you know about this, but maybe some of you are hearing about it for the first time. When you show up in Pocatello on your day off, one of the things that I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to look at all your navigation and make sure that uh, it looks kosher. Then I'm going to hand you a map with some directions about how to get through that section of the desert. There may even be a waypoint or two in there, which you can program into your GPS. Gaston Beatty Well will be common to almost all of the routes, which is why I left it on there as a challenge point. Uh, and if your route doesn't have Gaston Beatty Well on it, I'll have something else that you can claim as a challenge point. But I'm thinking right now I'll put that on all of them just because sort of right in the beginning it gives everybody something they can kind of work towards. So I'm going to give you a map. Uh, you're welcome to bring your own maps, too. A lot of people have said, what's the map that I want to use for the desert? And uh, I tell everybody, you know, any one of them you want to bring, they're all good. Any Delorum kind of map or the Cal Topo maps are good, the Onyx maps are good. Any of those will work. But I'm going to hand you a map, and I'm going to hand you some directions. And it's going to be distances, compass bearings, and the occasional waypoint. So, you know, your directions might be something like, here's a fence line, follow it six miles north. Then go northwest across the lava rock at this compass bearing for three miles until you see this feature. And that's going to be the kind of thing it is. It's actual navigation. It's, it's a combination of being able to read a map and some dead reckoning because I'm going to have you look for some things. It's not going to be tremendously hard. I'm not trying to get anybody lost or anything. It won't even be technically that difficult. I'm not going to take anybody through anything that's harder than what you've done already out there. What this is designed to do is encourage you to actually learn how to navigate as opposed to just trying to follow lines on your GPS. Uh, in the past, we allowed people to use routes as long as they created their own routes, but it's, it's painfully obvious to me that about a third of the teams I talked to last year didn't really create their own routes. Now, none of those people made it. Everybody that made it looked like they had really worked on the navigation and and had it stacked. But there were people that showed up here that clearly had just gotten her out from somebody else. And uh, I, I can tell by the answers to your questions that you didn't create this by yourself. Because I know some of the thought processes you would have had to go through. And I can also tell by the way you ride it. I can also tell when your partner drops out and you go, well, I intend to ride the two-person route the rest of the tour. The reason for that is because they created the route or you guys got a two-person route from somebody else. And that's all you know. You don't have the ability to just look at the waypoints for the other one and navigate by those. So this year, that all stops. This year, we're, for at least this little bit, you're going to have to actually navigate. Again, a combination of compass bearings, distances, a little bit of dead reckoning. So you'll need a compass. The compass in any GPS unit that you have will do. But if you want to get a, a cool little compass, which you can buy for $5 off Amazon, go ahead and get one. Um, any map will be fine. Again, I will provide you with a map, sort of a map. And then you need a way to accurately keep track of distance. And, you know, with all the stuff that you've already got in your bike, if you can't do that, then um, I don't know what to tell you. It's about 40 to 50 miles as the crow flies across that desert to Big Southern Butte. The distances that you're going to go are longer than that because they're going to zigzag a little bit. 
But I would say that at no point will the route that I give you be more than 75 miles between where the navigation stops and where it picks up again. It should be somewhere between 50 and 75 miles is what I would count on. I'm going to go out and measure them all in the next few weeks, and and uh, I'll, I'll let you know what your distance is going to be on the route that I give you. So, yeah, you, you've always had to carry some gas in that day because it's – somewhere around 150 miles from American Falls to Arco. And uh, it's still going to be somewhere around 150, but I would say on the short end of it, it'll be 140. On the long end of it, it might be 160, 170, maybe 175, somewhere through there. Still not one of your longest gas list stretches, but uh, since you're in the middle of nowhere, I might encourage you to carry a little bit of gas for this. So you'll get across the desert. And again, I I think most of you will enjoy this and you won't have a very difficult time with it. And all everything is going to lead you to Big Southern Butte. You're going to pop out of the desert somewhere on one of the major roads that leads to the Butte, which is where navigation picks up again. So you go to the top of the Butte. There's a challenge point there. And after that, you are about 90 minutes from Arco, Idaho. So. You should get into Arco. A pretty good time to get into Arco on day two is somewhere around six or seven at night. That gets you set up for your next trail day, and you're in pretty good shape if you can do that. So that's the beta max that I've got on day two. Um, Let's see. So questions about day two. What do you got for me? I see there's a bunch of people logged in out there, and I'm seeing a whole bunch of hellos and howdies and stuff like that. Light me up with day two questions. Uh, Sean Smith, how do we meet you on the rest day? Text message to organize, Facebook messenger. Uh, I, I, we'll find each other. What I give everybody during tour season is uh, I have a Google number, and uh, I give you my Google number, and you can text me. and um, So you can send text messages. You can call me. You can do whatever you want to do, Facebook messenger. I like using the Google number because everybody has the same number. Everybody has it just – Tell me who you are, and uh, we'll find out. But but we'll get together somehow. You know, if I don't get you at the flagpole the night before so that we can talk about all that, yeah, just send me a text message to the Google number. How far from American Falls to Arco? As I said a few minutes ago, on last year's route, it was about 150 miles. This year, it will be anywhere from 140 to 175 on the high end. That'll be what it is. What else you got for me? Let's see if there's anything earlier here. There were some guys today riding up on Chinese Peak that looked like they were on tour bikes. Uh, I've been seeing people out and about a little bit, uh, which is good. Somebody asked the last time about when I thought day one was going to be rideable this year, if you wanted to pre-ride it, which is allowed in the rules and, and not a bad idea at all. This year, my guess is it'll be late June. Uh, you know, right now, everybody always thinks that's crazy. Oh, you got to be able to get over that before late June. Uh, not really, because there's some shady spots up high where that snow persists pretty late. And even though it's been a low snow year, um, uh, you know, late June may be kind of pessimistic, but I, I don't know that I'd try it before June 1st. Uh, last year, there were some people that were unpleasantly surprised at the amount of snow that they found up high. Uh, I don't know how late, well, how late is pickles open? Here's somebody else that hadn't figured out StreamYard. I don't know. Uh, that's not the place you want to go anyway. There's better places in Arco to eat. I know everybody digs sitting in the chair in front of pickles, but there's a pizzeria there. That's awesome. There's a steakhouse There's some, there's some pretty good stuff. I'm trying to think while I'm waiting on some more questions, if there's anything else I can think about on day two. Uh, you know, if you watch the Jimmy video, he describes day two as a beater and it was harder than he thought it was going to be. Several other teams have made that remark too. We eliminated most of the stuff that was really kicking the crap out of people. A lot of it was on that section right out of American Falls until you got to the Sand Bowl. There used to be about 30 miles of trails there. Well, it wasn't 30, it was maybe 20 miles of whoops and kind of nasty stuff and it was hard to find your way. That stuff's all gone. And uh, it, um, 
it really speeds the day up the way we do it now. There's there's a little bit of sand in a couple of spots, so it knocks 90 minutes off that day. So I wouldn't be as worried about day two as I used to be. And that's also one of the reasons why I decided to put this navigational challenge. It's sort of in the middle, well, in the latter third of day two, just because we had shortened up the day so much technically by taking really the hardest stuff out of it that it seemed prudent in order to sort of keep it the way it has been for teams that have come through in prior years to try to keep the the day sort of equal in difficulty to add a little extra challenge out in the desert farther north. And that desert farther north is nice. It's, it's mostly high speed stuff. There are some gates you got to open and close, but I'm going to try to keep you as, as way from as many of those as I can. So when I'm putting together these routes, I'm going to try to find places where you don't have to open and close 30 or 40 gates. Uh, Ralph confirming you are recommending avoiding day two challenge section unless team gets an extremely early start. That is absolutely correct. Wonderful challenge section, wonderful trails to ride, but go back and ride it some other time if you're not from here. Um, it, it, it just it doesn't advance you enough to make it worthwhile. The tour of Idaho is the tour of energy conservation. And you don't care about setting record times, trying to do every bonus section, every challenge section. You care about getting to Sundance Mountain under the rules, having satisfied all the challenge point requirements. That's all you care about, or it's all you should care about. So to me, I'm thinking when I'm looking at a challenge section, there's two things. One, Am I technically, do I have the technical ability to do this without killing myself, without really wearing myself out? And for me, the answer to that, for all except one or two of them, is yeah, I can ride that. It's not a problem. But then the second thing comes in is, all right, what, what does this do to me energetically? I mean, would it have been easier for me to ride the regular route in terms of conserving energy? And in some cases, the challenge section, it's a little bit more technical, but it, it, it either shaves time off the route or at least it doesn't penalize you because you end up farther north somewhere. This one doesn't do any of that. It, it, it basically doesn't advance you very far. It puts you back very close to where you started. So you burn some energy. You didn't put you ahead any, and it's on an already long day. Those are all reasons to say, yeah, maybe I'm going to pass this one. Uh, you know, the... I'm trying to think of challenge sections that uh, sat at, like the day five challenge section is a pretty good one because uh, doesn't bypass anything that's cool and it, it it advances you a little bit. It's pretty fast. The only thing it does is it gets you into salmon later. Uh, the day stick CS same thing. You know it's kind of technical, but it uh, doesn't take any longer. It advances you down the trail. Uh, the day seven CS, don't do that. The day eight CS saves you 40 miles if you have the ability to do it, but that's one of the tougher ones. Uh, uh, the day nine challenge section, I would not do. And the day 10 challenge section, super easy. I'd do that if I needed another one. So that's kind of the rundown there. Um, any cell service in the desert? Caleb, it depends on who your carrier is. Uh, and they all have blank spots out there. Uh, I have T-Mobile, and I occasionally get really good cell service in places out there, but it really just depends on where you're at. I would not count on it. That's going to be a place where, you know, again, your PLB is going to be pretty important if something goes wrong because I know it'll work out there, but I'm not so sure about your cell phone. It really just depends on where you're at. And it's kind of weird, too. My cell phone works deep in the desert way in the middle of nowhere it doesn't work in american falls where i can basically see cars going by in the freeway rick are you seeing many people running moose tubeless no i am not uh occasionally it happens but most people uh eventually come to the same communal wisdom that the vast majority of tour vets and i all agree on which is that you want to keep it simple and really simple is ultra heavy duty tubes run some slime in them and uh and desert racing tires of some type if you do that stiff sidewall tires two bead locks in the back uh ultra heavy duty tubes i like the bridge stones and uh, somebody else makes one that's really good too uh, they also make the world's heaviest rear tire um who is that there's somebody else that makes a really good ultra heavy duty tube 
if you run those and you have the ability to air up and air down a little bit, that's all I ever do. You know, I can take a couple of those CO2 canisters with me. And when I'm out in the, in the sand, I might air down a little bit just because it'll help me get through that a little bit easier. But with that setup, ultra heavy duty tubes with moose in them, I've never had a flat. Uh, you know, I've done six tours of Idaho and I've ridden my bikes extensively. And I literally have not had a flat in 10 years. Yeah, I've come back with slime, you know, coming out of a hole somewhere, but the tire would still hold pressure. And with twin bead locks and those super stiff tires, I had a buddy of mine that uh, got a like a railroad spike through his rear tire. It was huge. The Whatever it was, was as big as my thumb. And we were out in the middle of Mojave once a long time ago. And he had an ultra heavy duty tube. And he had a super stiff tire on that thing. Uh, maybe the... Uh, the 81 dual carcass, the, the real stiff desert racing tire that Dunlop makes. Twin B locks, and I rode his tire 60 miles with a hole in it the size of my thumb. It basically wouldn't hold any air, but as long as you were in the sand, it, it rode just fine. Um, yeah, two tours with Bridgestone UHD tubes and zero flats. Again, I've been doing this stuff for 15 years now. Tour of Idaho Contrails, and I have never, ever had a flat with that setup. I know a lot of people like tubeless. I know a lot of people like bib moose and stuff like that. The last team that I talked to that ran bib mooses that were successful, I talked to them and they all told me afterwards they wish they hadn't had them because at the end they were suffering significant wear. Now, stay of the art always advances. Those things are getting better and better and better. And at some point, I think that'll be a viable alternative. I think you'll be able to do those things just fine. But for right now, I'm sticking with what I know until somebody comes along with something that is clearly better than ultra heavy duty tubes with a pretty good dollop of slime in them and, uh, you know, a pump so you can change the pressures a little bit. That works for me. I just think it's a good way to go. The Sedona and the Mitchell and ultra heavy duty tubes are not as heavy duty as the, as the Bridgestone. And I'm trying to think of who this is. They make it. They make tires. Moto Z. Moto Z makes a really good ultra heavy duty tube. Um, I haven't tried it myself, but I've talked to people that have uh, used them, and they swear up and down they're even beefier than the Bridgestone. They say you have a hard time getting your tire on when you put the tube in, and that's also true with uh, any of those ultra heavy duty tubes. They're pretty beefy. All right, we got a few minutes left. I can take questions, but I'm out of things to talk about. If nobody has anything else question-wise, next week will be day three. And uh, there's a little bit more to day three than there is day two, so we'll be able to fill up an hour. Uh, and I might have a couple of uh, more equipment suggestions for you next week, too. Mark Stewart, D2CS, is that the one that goes by Frog Pond and the Nordic Ski Place? Uh the CS does not go by Frog Pond. The Nordic Ski Play, it does go by the Nordic Ski Place. The, the pond is the regular route. The, uh, the ski place is on the challenge section. That's exactly right. If you're a local, you're, you're going to know all those trails. And the cool part about it, you get to go up over the Indian Mountain single track, which is awesome. Caleb, do you recommend changing oil at any point in the tour? I never do it. I make sure that there's oil in the bike. But I don't change oil. I don't. I, I told everybody a couple of weeks ago I use filter skins, so I don't change my filter. I just stack a bunch of filter skins, one on top of the other. I don't even oil them. I just stack them up on top of a well-oiled, fresh filter when I start. And uh, I, I think I, I might take a couple in my pocket as well, but I usually start out with two or three on the filter, and I just keep pulling them off. You're not racing. So those things are going to work just fine. And even a lot of racers stack those things, a lot of desert racers that deal with a lot of dust. And when it comes to changing oil, the only thing that I do is make sure there's oil in the bike. Modern oils are really, really, really good. And if you're using any of these synthetics or partial to synthetics, you're going to be able to get that bike through a Tour of Idaho just fine without changing the oil. Uh, if you want to change your oil, that's fine. You know, change it in Pocatello. After day one, that makes sense to do. You're going to have a hard time finding the time to do it at any other point along the way. You know, that's up to you. You know, if you can find the time to do it, that's fine. But don't do what the doofus did a couple years ago 
up at North Fork, which is change your oil and change your filter in your room and then leave the room filthy. Oil all over the place, filters in the garbage can and stuff like that. That's no good. You know, if you do that, then I'm going to be after you. So if you're going to change oil, you know, be sure to be responsible about it. Find a service station or something where they'll let you do it in their parking lot and you can dispose of the refuse in a uh, responsible way. All right. Well, I don't see any more questions, so I'm going to go ahead and sign off tonight. Uh, again, next week we'll do D3 and maybe a little bit more about equipment. Uh, once again, I, I I cannot recommend that Adventure GTX boot highly enough. I know that most people aren't going to want to go out. You've already got boots, and you don't want to go spend another 475 bucks on a set of boots. I'm telling you what, whoo, are those things good boots. They are very, very comfortable. They're not just comfortable to walk around in. They're really comfortable to ride in because the sole is really thick and it's kind of plush and soft. So when you're whacking through rocks and, uh, you know, we were out in that 100 miles of those nasty whoops, I could like I could even stand on the heels of those things. And it was like standing on shock absorbers. Really, really, really cool boots. Now, I know the hardcores will say, yeah, well, that doesn't give you sufficient feel through the pegs of your bike. Ah, oh, screw all that bullshit. <laughs> you're going to be... The main thing that you are dealing with on the tour is fatigue and loss of energy, and you're just getting the crap beat out of you. And anything that that, that ameliorates that a little bit, ameliorates that fatigue, is a good thing. And I'm telling you what, those boots are super good boots. And when you got to walk around in them, you're really going to like it. All right. Uh, Let's see. Okay. I'll see you all next week. Thanks a lot for joining us. Thanks a lot for an hour of your time. I hope this helps you out in your tour planning. And uh, I'm really looking forward to actually being able to get out and ride and saw and maintain some trails this year. And I'll get those routes in the desert figured out as soon as I can. See you all next week. Ciao.